Before we get down to the nitty gritty, I want to thank my animators Adam Mitsuk or Kuzim and Tyler Addison for the animations in this video. If you like their work, consider following them on Twitter. Links in the description and comment section below. Now, on with the show. The Morrison Formation is a world-renowned layer of rock that dates to the late Jurassic period. Many animals have been uncovered from these layers, including the largest and most adeptly qualified salad munchers and steak cutters to ever walk the face of the planet. One of these animals carried three crests atop its craggly skull, a line of armored scoots down its back, and a pair of small but handy arms. Meet your old friend, Ceratosaurus. <laughs> Biology of Horned Himbos It's not the size that counts. It's how you use it. There are currently three relatively valid species of this beast, Nasicornis, Dentis alcatus, and Magnicornis. They differ in some minor skeletal characteristics, but also in size. The largest specimen was estimated to be about 8.8 .8 meters, 28 feet in length, and 980 kilograms, 2,160 pounds in weight. This estimation was made informally by Madsen and was changed to 7 meters, 23 feet long, and between 452 kilograms, 996 pounds, and 700 kilograms, 1,540 pounds, when some better math was applied. Though the specimen was downsized just a tad, I don't really see it as out of the question that some ceratosauruses got as big as 8.8 .8 meters, or potentially a tad larger. We just haven't found them yet. The smaller specimens, on the other hand, have been estimated at 400 kilograms, 881 pounds, to 670 kilograms, 1,480 pounds, and 5.3 meters, 17 feet, to 6 meters, 20 feet. <sighs> That's a lot of numbers I just threw at you, but they matter to some people. I just think it's neat that Ceratosaurus was this big, and yet still considered lower on the size spectrum compared to what it lived with. Little baby, baby, baby man. Little baby, baby man. Ceratosaurus has some rather small arms. Not quite as tiny as Tyrannosaurus or Abelisaurus, but small compared to Allosaurus or the primitive Manoraptorans it lived alongside. These arms ended in four chunky fingies, three of which were tipped with long, dangerous talons. The presence of four fingers is something more common among theropod dinosaurs that branched off the theropod family tree pretty early. Critters like Coelophysoids, Dilophosaurs, and the Ceratosaurian-derived Abelosaurs all retained this early feature as well. The Ceratosaurus paw is wide and short, with a set of recurved talons. Obviously, they still had a use, even in their diminutive state, as they'd be a lot more obviously useless if they weren't being used. The true list of uses for Ceratosaurus's arms, in the arms of any dinosaur for that matter, is probably longer and more surprising than we can ever imagine. Ceratosaurus could have used its nose pickers to hold on to struggling prey as it killed it, to carry around already dead prey for late night snacking, for scratching themselves and others like adorable reptilian murder kittens, to push themselves up after laying down, for making sweet, sweet love. Watch my video on dinosaur sex, and more. Since Ceratosaurus arms were relatively small, I don't see them being used frequently in offensive combat. The smaller and younger animals seem to have longer arms proportional to their bodies than the older and larger animals, which seems to be a common characteristic amongst most theropod dinosaurs, which may mean the younger animals were using their arms more, while their jaw strength matured to that of an adult. Suit of Amor the holotype material of our handsome horned himbo preserved some small rounded triangular pieces of bone situated above the narrow spines of the vertebrae in the neck and base of the tail. These pieces of bone are identified as osteoderms. Osteoderms are simply little pieces of bone that are planted underneath the skin of an animal. Some critters have a keratin sheath covering the place where the bone is, and some don't. 
They are often used as defensive, chainmail-like armor and may have been co-opted for display in some of the non-avian dinosaurs. The presence of these triangular armor bits on the neck, near the base of the skull, and at the base of the tail, suggests they probably formed a ridge of scutes from the base of the skull to the end of the tail. These osteoderms have also been found in other specimens of Ceratosaurus, suggesting most of them had this kind of ridge you usually see in pop culture's depictions of dinosaurs. Osteoderms have also been found associated with other parts of their body, as in the holotype of the Ceratosaurus nasacornis species. But what about feathers? It's not impossible that these animals had feathers, whether of cassowary type or quill type, but considering the presence of the crocodilian-like pieces of armor embedded in the skin, it is more likely these animals and their relatives were devoid of feathers. This makes sense since the ceratosaurs gave rise to the abelosaurs, which are considered one of the few lineages almost entirely covered in scales, scutes, and armors. Peacocking is bad and you shouldn't do it. The biggest, most obvious characteristic of the animal is the crests. Ceratosaurus had a pointed and rounded piece of bone above the nasal openings on the skull. This crest has rugose patterning, which suggests it was covered in a keratinous sheath when the animal is alive. Ceratosaurus had two more erupting from the front of each eye, which were much like the nose horn and also similar to the allosaurs it lived with. The animal probably used these crests for display, as keratin can be rather colorful, and they are bigger and more elaborate on adult individuals and small and underdeveloped in juveniles. That usually means this kind of structure was more important to sexually mature animals. Crests of ceratosaurus are much too thin and fragile to be used as physical defense, and even in shoving matches these pieces of bone would break too easily, which points even more to the use as display only. What big teeth you have If you've heard about ceratosaurus before, I'll bet one of the things you've heard about it is how big its toofers are. This is true, but not for the reason you might think. They weren't naturally ultra-long saw blade teeth. When an animal, especially one with long pointy teeth like some theropod dinosaurs, dies, the ushi-scushi stuff that kept the teeth attached to the jaw bones decays and falls apart. Once that happens, the teeth begin to slip and or slide out of the mouth. If the teeth stop at a certain point before tumbling out, and the bones are then completely buried in the first step of fossilization, then the teeth are preserved in such a way to make them look longer than they would have been when the animal was alive. This phenomenon is called tooth slippage, and is a major problem with toothy dinos. Ever hear that Tyrannosaurus teeth are as big as bananas? Well, they are if you count the entire tooth rather than the bit that stuck out of the jaw. Most dinosaur teeth only stuck out enough to be used as a single tooth in the saw blade that was the critter's jaws. Ceratosaurus didn't have super long teeth, but they were still a tad longer than what you see in other theropods. This is a defining trait of Ceratosaurus too, so it's helpful if trying to identify a close relative. Cranial Kinesis? I barely know her! Dr. Robert Bob Bucker was one of the guys responsible for the dinosaur renaissance of the 1980s and 90s. This period encapsulates the reimagining of the dinosaur's paleobiology based on evidence of high metabolisms and biomechanics along the lines of mammals and birds. It saw our favorite theropod friends go from fat, toddling, tail-dragging killers to intelligent, fast-moving predators like we see today. Dr. Bakker discussed the skull bones of Ceratosaurus in his book, The Dinosaur Heresies, which was the tome that nailed down most of the evidence for the ideas which came out of the dinosaur renaissance. Bakker argued that the skull bones of Ceratosaurus were only loosely held together. This would mean that the animal had some degree of movement among these skull bones. This condition is seen most perfectly in snakes, but is also found in lizards, parrots, fish, and some early amphibians. Bakker also posited this level of movement for the lower jaw. He suggested that the bones of the jaw could move against each other, and that the quadrate bone of the skull was capable of swinging outwards. Together, this would mean the skull could shift and widen at the jaw joint, giving the animal the ability to swallow meals much larger than it would if it couldn't do this. 
This is called cranial kinesis. Unfortunately for this pretty neat idea, studies in the years after this book have all but proven this as an impossibility for most known theropod dinosaurs. Casey Holliday and Larry Whitmer of Whitmer Lab reevaluated these claims in other theropod dinosaurs, like Tyrannosaurus and Allosaurus, using computed tomography scans and computer generated imaging models that utilize a lot of physics and biomechanical calculations. They concluded that muscle powered cranial kinesis couldn't be proven for any dinosaur species they looked at, which included groups that Ceratosaurus belonged to. This means that cranial kinesis for theropod dinosaurs is pretty unlikely. Tall Tails If we take a look at the front part of the tail of Ceratosaurus, you'll notice that the neural arches of the vertebrae are tall and do not bend backwards as far as other theropods. This means that the tail would have a very tall profile in side view and was also quite wide. A tall, wide tail allowed for big caudal femoralis muscles which attached the thigh to the tail, helping the animal move the leg in intense ways for running. All this suggests an animal that used its tail a lot. Paleontologist Robert Bacher and Gray Burr hypothesized in 2004 that Ceratosaurus hunted primarily aquatic prey due to the combination of thick, crocodile-like tail and long, recurved teeth. The scientists found that throughout over 50 localities of the Morrison Formation, the teeth of Ceratosaurus, as well as Torvosaurs, were most commonly found near water sources. This suggests an animal that was more at home hunting for lungfish and crocodiles in the rivers, lakes, and streams of late Jurassic floodplains than long-distance hunting of agile prey. The study suggests Ceratosaurus was the more aquatic predator, while Torvosaurus was more of the terrestrial predator that would come to the rivers to hunt when the large herbivores had migrated due to the summer dry seasons. Like with all things in science, this paper got a rebuttal paper that showed how the reasons for thinking the thing they thought was actually incorrect and that they should think this way because of reason X, Y, and Z, but like in a good way. Paleontologist Shangyu Yun published a paper on the idea of a semi-aquatic ceratosaurus in 2019. One of the biggest problems with labeling something semi-aquatic in scientific literature is that no one has ever gotten together and collectively agreed upon what semi-aquatic actually means. Like with any good debate, you have to define your terms first. But everyone has been using their own definition of semi-aquatic, assuming the definition is intuitive. For example, water deers are a species of tusked cervid native to China and Korea. They spend a lot of time in marshes, swamps, and rivers of the region when foraging for yummy gummy soft water plants. However, when not feeding, they prefer to be on dry land. Are they semi-aquatic for doing that? They don't have any adaptations specifically for being in the water, at least no more than any other land animal. The vast majority of land animals retain the ability to swim or move through water. It's kind of an intuitive survival instinct we all need. So right off the bat, the use of semi-aquatic for Ceratosaurus is dubious, unless thoroughly defined. In the 2004 paper by Bacher and Burr, they described the adaptations of Ceratosaurus as similar to modern crocodilians, so it's safe to assume their definition of semi-aquatic is the type of semi-aquatic adaptation seen in crocodilians. Okay, I guess that narrows it down a bit. Chang Yu Yun laid out all of the arguments made by Bakker and Burr as to why they described Ceratosaurus as semi-aquatic. These include a resemblance between the tail of Ceratosaurus and Crocs by way of tall neural spines at the base of the tail, their very deep chevron bones on the underside of the tail, and a tail far more flexible than those of Allosaurus or Torvosaurus. For the first argument, it turns out that crocodilians have tall neural spines throughout most of the tail's length. Ceratosaurus, on the other hand, only has tall neural spines at the base of the tail. Strike one. The type of tall neural spines near the base of the tail is seen in theropod dinosaurs traditionally known as fully terrestrial, like Abelosaurus, Giganotosaurus, Gallimimus, and Struthiomimus, among others. Strike two. The neural spines found in crocs are subcircular in cross-section, they're big ol' bony cylinders. 
Ceratosaurus, on the other hand, has a blade-shaped neural spine with a flat cross-section, which is seen in most other theropod dinosaur neural spines. Strike 3! Is it out? Not yet. The depth of the chevron bones is not a great tell as to whether or not an animal was semi-aquatic, no matter how you want to define that word. Deep chevron bones are found in basically all theropod dinosaurs, especially the big meaty ones that walked on land for Shurzies. Let me give you some examples. Herrerasaurus, Caudipteryx, Heuania, and Conchoraptor also have deep as hell chevrons, and yet they are definitely mostly terrestrial. Curious. Strike 4. The flexibility of the ceratosaurus tail is not a great indicator of a semi-aquatic lifestyle. This is because virtually all terrestrial theropod dinosaurs have a flexible as hell tail too. Sure, semi-aquatic beasts have a super flexi tube tail as well, but it's just not something you can use to tell you something is definitely semi-aquatic. Terrestrial animals need that flexi tube tail in order to swim if the need arises, but not for living most of their lives in water. Strike 5. On top of all of this, you usually see a lot more adaptations for something that has returned to the water to live most or some of its life there. Crocodilians are highly specialized for this kind of lifestyle, and they were the ones Bakker and Bird decided to use as a comparison. Big oof. Crocodilians are probably one of the worst things to compare with dinosaurs, despite their relations. Sure, crocodilians are the closest living cousins to the non-avian dinosaurs, but they diverged from that family tree a long time ago in order to be big flat f**ks and slosh around in the swamps. There's not a single dinosaur, alive or dead, that convergently evolved similar adaptations to the crocodilians. That's including Spinosaurus, you nitpickers. To be fair, birds are a bad comparison too, but less so than crocs, cause like, damn. Semi-aquatic Stratosaurus is pretty much dead in the water. Make sure you leave a like and comment on this video, share it around and subscribe. While you're at it, ring the notification bell too if you want to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. Want to help Edge out? Subscribe to the Patreon at any tier you like for a whole smorgasbord of delicious offerings. Many thanks to Thea Svensson, Steve Bradshaw, Staniforth Hopkins, Natty Cat. Dinosaur, Arda Bayer, Abby Smith, Henry Brennan, Dana Manchester, Chris Frampton, and Antron. You've all helped to make this channel possible. Thank you, thank you, thank you.